2. Amazing. We're just letting everyone in now. Thank you so much, guys, for waiting. Um, Brilliant. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us today um, at Melbourne Entrepreneurial Centre's final fireside chat of 2021. Um, just before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I'd just like to ask for everyone to keep your microphones muted until we get to the audience Q&A later on in the session today. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to advise you that the session is being recorded um, and we'll upload it onto our MEC YouTube page um, later on just so you guys can um, watch it again later. Uh, so my name is Abby, I'll be hosting the chat today. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator here at MEC and on behalf of the team, including the teams from MAP and TRAM, thank you so much for attending today's session. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how the fireside chat is going to work, um, we'll have an interview for about half an hour with Dr. Adam Bumpus, and then we'll open up to you for questions. Uh, so taking that will take us right through then to the end of the session. So please feel free to send questions in via the chat as and when they come to you. That would be great. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country from where I'm speaking from today. And that's on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woi, Wurrung and Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation. I recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I'd like to pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that are here today. I'd also like to encourage you to pay respects to the traditional owners of the lands that you're on this afternoon. Uh, so our fireside chat series is designed to help founders learn from people who have been there and done that. Um, you'll hear the journey of a prominent entrepreneur in the startup ecosystem, how they did it and what worked for them. So we hope you'll have some uh, actionable advice to take away today um, and maybe some strategies that might assist you in your own entrepreneurial journey. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Adam Bumpus. Uh, so Adam is a senior lecturer uh, in entrepreneurship in the Department of Management and Marketing at the University of Melbourne, as well as the CEO and co-founder of energy tech company Redgrid. He's a climate change solutions expert and since 2002 he has worked in environmental communications and in the role of technology in climate change and sustainable development. His startup Redgrid builds a software ecosystem which enables energy assets to understand each other, transact and aims to drive emissions to net zero by 2030. Uh, prior to co-founding Redgrid, Adam set up and ran a communications agency delivering international climate and energy development projects. And he also co-founded and led carbon analysis for the startup Greenstar back in our home of the UK. Um, currently, Adam leads research on entrepreneurship and the clean energy economy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Adam. Welcome. Great to be here, Abby. Thanks very much for having me. And great to see so many faces. So thanks for joining. Fantastic. Um, so let's just kick off with a couple of questions. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, so hey everyone. So look, um, I didn't start off as an entrepreneur. I started off actually as a scientist. So my, my undergraduate is in ecology. So I studied the systems of the way our natural environment works and how humans interact with it. Uh, and through that, I kind of got really into environmental politics and the role of corporations in either destroying or saving the environment. And um, really kind of came out of that and, and started thinking about, well, how do we create systemic change uh, to deal with problems like climate change, biodiversity loss? And for me, it was always a, um, a, a combination of using markets, using the right incentives in markets, internalizing uh, environmental externalities, but more than that, finding ways that markets actually inspire and innovate other people to, to make changes themselves. And so that's where I kind of, it kind of br brought me through. I wrote my PhD on carbon finance uh, back in the day when the carbon markets were worth uh, 36 billion dollars a year and, and just really looking at how we can use a combination of, of technologies uh, plus policy incentives to enable really transformative change and so that kind of spurred me and the big conclusion from, uh, from my PhD was like 
okay, the only way we're going to figure this climate change thing out is to make it equitable so that more people can benefit from new clean energy technologies, that the technology has to work for those end users and that it has to be at a global scale. And, and I think from that, I sort of, you know, fell into this idea, okay, well, how are we going to use technology to create transactive systems that enable a clean energy future to, to be as fast as possible? And so um, combine that with, uh, you know, working around the world with some really great organizations, institutions. So, you know, visiting scholar at Stanford and Berkeley. I was at UBC in Canada for a while. Um, we just sort of started seeing these, all these amazing people out there doing things. And I think that's kind of inspired me to think about, well, academia is really good as well uh, to get people to think about how they can put their theories and research into practice. You kind of got to get out there and do the practice as well. So that's kind of where I ended up being both a lecturer and an entrepreneur at the same time, which is an interesting and challenging kind of approach sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds amazing. Sounds good. Um, so I will get into a little bit just about your startup, Redgrid. Um, mm -hmm. So Redgrid is on a mission to deliver clean, affordable energy for the world. Um, the company helps to create clean energy transactions throughout Australia and in other parts of the world using software that delivers a clean energy future. Um, would you be able to just give us a little bit of background on mm -hmm. Redgrid? Um, how did you come to find it? Uh, sorry, find it. Um, and yeah, and how did you, you know, come to be a founder for a big group? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so as you mentioned, kind of in my like, little bio, that I, you know, founded a couple of other organisations as well, and consultancies, and Green Star, and then you know our, our communications consultancy, and mm -hmm. and it was really all of the. So it's not. So yeah, I'm still in the entrepreneurial journey, right? So there's no like, yeah. it's not like we've made this amazing thing and it's all working and it's it is, it's it, yeah. <laughs> although i am currently at our like we're actually we feel like we're kind of getting there i'm currently at our corporate retreat that we have at the end of the year so we've got two days away from the office where we're kind of taking time out to reflect on what we've done and where we're going and so anytime now you might see a bunch of my team members walk past but um the key yeah. i think for for me in this is that um it was always something that was ticking away inside of me that I needed to do something more than just do the research. The research is really important, but I needed to do something more to see actually how it's implemented. Now, what is it that I think for all entrepreneurs who they have this drive to um, firstly make a bunch of inventions that don't work and they have a, they want to try new things to get things done by, by the very nature of what you're doing as an entrepreneur, you're doing something that is, is not normal, is not the kind of mainstream. And most people are not going to get what you're doing and that's okay. So you've got to kind of be, you know, real, realize that's going to happen. So for me, I kind of came through these journeys, a few different kind of startups, things didn't work, some things did work. And then we kind of ended up in this space. I was thinking about, this was about 2018, 2017, 2018. And I was thinking about back to my days of looking at carbon finance. I was like, what is it that is going to really deal, try and deal with the climate change issue at a, at a structural level? And for me, I was like, it can't, like we just saw policy just being killed over and over and over again. And just not like, not fast enough. Like we had Paris Accord in 2015, fantastic. But even the pledges from that are not gonna get us where we need to do for climate change. And I just really had a strong, like sit down and think about, okay, where is it we can make a difference? And I really thought about this transactions approach. Like what is it about? We've got all these clean energy resources coming in, but why are we still getting this problem of emissions? Why are we still seeing the power sector as a major emitter of emissions around the world? And it seemed to me that you just couldn't get the power to the right people, the right places, the right types. So how can we solve that? And I came from this world where you're doing emissions reductions. You've got to calculate those emissions reductions to make them valuable in the market. That's what I spent my time working on. We don't have that at scale really in the rest of the world in terms of power. And so what are the technology implementations that can go in for that? And I was really looking at blockchain. I was like, okay, how can blockchain really help with this? Some of my PhD students had looked at it, they're doing fantastic stuff in this space now as well. And I was like, how can we do this? So at the time I had some friends who um, people I knew that were in the space. And one guy said to me, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this thing. Do you want to come and be involved in that? And so over lunch, we just sort of talked about it. And I went to hang out with him. He said, I've got a bunch of other people working on this why don't we start to put it together? And so we did, and through that, I, um, it was a mutual friend that introduced me to my co-founders. And so uh, I came from this carbon finance background and I was like, I wanna do something in this, but I don't know much about what this whole kind of blockchain thing is, but I think there's something in there for carbon finance. Uh, and my co-founder came from, uh, one of my co-founders came from banking and finance. And he was did payments and settlements for one of our massive banks in Australia, one of the big four, and he ran their blo blockchain. Um, component. So I was like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing there. Another guy came in as this young gun marketing. 
who um <laughs> who's at Melbourne Uni. I don't know if he's even finished his degree yet, but he just knows how how to like get people inspired about stuff. He was involved, and we had another guy who runs an AI tech, one of Melbourne's premier AI technology companies. And so the four of us said, okay, cool. How do we build this thing? So that's where Regret started. We just had this idea that hey, we've got this problem in transactions. We think there's going to be a transactive energy market coming in the future. The policy kind of tends that way. And yet there isn't a solution right now that does that really well. We think the blockchain can do it. And immediately we found out that a blockchain could not do it. And it was really bad at doing that in 2018. And so we then took a step back and you know we were going to do an ICO. We we're going to do all this stuff. It was all happening. And we just looked at the technology like that is it's not fit for purpose for the problem. So we took a step back and we started building a business with a product that people could use and really put into place right now. And then, and, but based on a very specific form of protocol that sits underneath it, which makes it really work well. So that's kind of the journey. And, and since then, I mean, I guess, how do we get the thing up and running? I often get asked this question like, okay, how do you actually start? We started by the stuff I was studying before, which was hackathons and accelerators. So we said, right, cool. Let's just apply to a bunch of hackathons and accelerators. So we applied to the Melbourne Uni PowerShop Accelerator, a hackathon, sorry, it was over a weekend. We came in, we met a bunch of awesome people. We worked together and we won the hackathon. So that was awesome. After the first two days, great. Okay, there's a bit of validation. There's something in here. Yeah. Then we, um, we got involved with the arena uh, like the Australian Renewable Energy Agency kind of accelerators. We thought, okay, we'll put an application for it. I was at Melbourne, I was, I was at the uni, I was like, okay, we're going to put this application, recording it like for two minutes in a broom cupboard somewhere, stuck it in, <laughs> and yeah. we got in. And that was awesome. So suddenly we're in there with all these amazing other companies and people doing really great stuff. We came out of that with a bunch of really great validation and ideas of what to do. And then, you know, that for me was like, okay, how do we turn these nice ideas that we've been talking about over lunch for the last sort of three months into something tangible. And it was really taking that leap to go out there and try and talk to other people about it. That was the best validator of you've got something, a kernel of something in there. And then yeah. finally we applied for Startup Boot Campus Energy Australia, which was, you know, they have about a thousand companies apply and 10 get in and we were one of the 10. So it was a pretty intensive application process. Yeah. Yeah. Two days, we did 65 pitches in two days. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, then we got in. And that was the kind of thing that kind of took us to the next level. Fantastic. Incredible. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I actually have a question about startup uh, bootcamp energy accelerator. I'll get to that one in a second, but um, how did you manage to secure mm. red grids first project with mini grid operator soul share? Um, are there any tips that you'd be able to yeah. share with us about how to get a con contract or a project over the line or how to just, you know, approach companies and secure that conversation in the first place? It's a, it's a good question. So um, at the time I was, I was working on my research project, which was looking at accelerators and the role of accelerators. They were involved in the same accelerator that I was looking at. And um, I, I was really interested. I was sitting there. I remember these guys presenting and I, at the same time, we were just getting red grid off the ground. And they said, hey, we want to do this thing where we donate value from Germany to people in Bangladesh and we want a secure way of doing it. We think the blockchain can do it, but we don't know how to do it. And I was like, we can do that for you. Like we can literally write you that protocol in the next few days. And so we, I went up to him and said, Hey man, look, I'm doing this research stuff, but I'm also starting this company. We think we can help you with this. And we, and he said, okay, how much does that cost? We're like nothing. We will do the whole thing for free. We just want to work with you guys, form a partnership and prove that it can work. And so through that partnership, we partnered with, with SolShare in Bangladesh, with some developers in Germany, some others in Venezuela. And we put this thing together on five continents. We had people working from five continents on this project. My CTO, Simon, led the development of the protocol. And then he basically proved it in a pilot and just said, hey, someone with excess solar energy value here is willing to donate it to someone specifically over here. We couldn't get the currency all the way to Bangladesh because you couldn't use cryptocurrency in Bangladesh at that time, mm -hmm. but we could get it to fiat, into money, into that, pe that person's account. So what was really interesting is we showed in that initial pilot that you could create what was now and what we've just launched the global internet of energy the idea that you can send energy value not kilowatts not necessarily the electric not the electrons but you can send a value associated with energy in one place to somewhere else and it can have meaning for those people to form a virtual energy community so this person in germany was like okay cool i'm happy to donate five percent of my value person in bangladesh suddenly gets say five euros worth of energy put into their system and that's really interesting. It's a specific one person to one person specifically, not into a big pool of funds at the UN, which is fine, but actually specific. And that's yeah. really interesting because now there's a thing called decentralized 
uh, renewable energy credits, certificate uh, credits or renewable energy certificates. That means you can actually start to do this from a technology perspective. And we've just launched an NFT campaign doing this with mini grids in, in Rwanda. We're actually financing part of a energy system in a mini grid in a, in a refugee camp in Rwanda using our technology to go through a decentralized finance system. So, um, sorry, that was a bit of a sidetrack, but actually oh, yeah, as, we got to the, as we got to the project, we just said, hey, we'll do this for free. Like, yeah, help us. Let's do some marketing around this. Let's form this yeah. project. We want, what do we want to get out of it for us as a startup? We wanted to get, um, you know, validation. Like, does this thing work? Are people interested? Does it make sense to them? And they're an awesome company. They went on to, they went on to win the whole competition at the Accelerator. They're an amazing company. They won a bunch of UN awards. Um, and they're featured in the 2040 film that Damien Gamow did a few years ago. Awesome people, fantastic. And we're just now rekindling that first project that was free in 2018 into the new NFT project and getting them financing from the crypto world back into more of their energy projects. So I think, so for us, it's very, very much, look, I, I gotta be honest, when you're doing this entrepreneurship stuff, for me and for my co-founders, it was very much like, just go into your gut feel. Yeah. You know, like we couldn't charge these people for a project. Like, why would we charge them? Like. We have so much to learn. We have so much to figure out ourselves. So we just said, let's just do it for free and try and figure out how to do it. And they became long supporters of us. They became, we became supporters of them. We became friends. And now we're kind of doing all this stuff again. It's like, that's yeah, the most beautiful thing right. yeah. yeah, you get this opportunity to have these, build these relationships that are about creating. And that, I mean, is art and entrepreneurship and hardcore deep material science. I think they're the ones you can do the most creative work in. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, amazing um yeah incredible um so just to go back to i know you mentioned earlier just about startup boot camp energy accelerator so um yeah red grid went through that accelerator back in 2018 um how would you say the program accelerated red grid's growth um what would be your key takeaways and what advice would you give to many founders maybe going through an accelerator or thinking about applying for one um yeah it's it's it kicked our asses, to be honest. Like <laughs> we we arrived there as like, hey, we're like the home team. We're from Melbourne. Like you know, the guys are really great. Yeah. Hey, we're gonna get in here. This is gonna be awesome. They just like handed it to us. They, they were like, wow. Suddenly we realized what real kind of entrepreneurship and work really meant. Mm -hmm. um, we're suddenly thrown in front of a bunch of you know corporate executives who were trying to convince to take our solution. They're like, nope, nope, nope. Doesn't make sense. Nope, nope. Have you thought about this? Nope, nope. Just like wow, like sledgehammer each side. Yeah. And um, so we really, it was great. It was a super good wake up call. Okay, cool. How do we validate what we really need to do here? What are the problems we really need to solve? Um, and who, what language do we need to use to speak to get to work with larger organizations? And so it really, it put us into a very intensive, I mean, the first like first three weeks or so is, was all about, uh, thank you very much, um, was all about kind of how do we, how do we validate what our, what our, um, what our product is? How do we validate the problem that we're solving? And they basically took control of our diaries. <laughs> And just like back to yeah. back, put me yeah. in meetings with people like every single day. And so that was like the prelim for this was the 65 pitches in two days. Then we had to just do this thing for like three weeks. And, and for that, it really got us good at talking about what we were doing, talking about the problem, talking about an understanding from them what they think it's about as well. And that was really important because it was about figuring out that there's a, there's a bigger thing that we're trying to deal with here. So that was really good. Also, just a curriculum of shaping things up. You know, making sure you've got your lean canvas down, making sure you've got your value proposition canvas down, making sure you've got multiple ones of them over and over and over again. And I think that was, you know, I know we know this stuff theoretically because, you know, we teach it. But when you're, it's so e easy for me to go into my room of my students who've got fantastic students who are doing master's courses here or in uni startup. Um, and they're like, you can help them with their canvas till the cows come home because it's not your business. And then when it's your business, it's so hard yeah. because you're like, but, but that's my idea. And I think that's the best way. And it's not true. So it's a, that really kind of said, you know, um, yeah, it told us how to really taught us how to be self-critical and try and get through it. Still, we have problems with that still, that's not solved, but that's just the way it is. Um, but this last part, and this is something I've all that, you know, we've written about in our research is that the connections. So they essentially became shareholders in our company by being part of this, like that we gave up some equity for it. Mm -hmm. And, then they introduced us to these other people who we 
do deals with. So we've like they introduced us to the guys we're doing a hardware, working with hardware on. They introduced us to other investors. They introduced us and they gave us such great insight. And so the guys who are running it, really phenomenal people, really nice people. And we kind of have a rule at Red Grid that we only work with smart and nice people. There's just like a, it's a blanket rule. If you're not That's smart and nice, rule. it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, because you can be smart and horrible. It definitely doesn't work. So um, we, they were really smart and nice and they were just fantastic and they just hustled. And we're like good friends with these people now. And they're our shareholders. They put us in contact with people and now and they're good friends. And so it became like, now I can call up the, those guys who run it whenever I need to. And I'll have someone I can talk to about a problem I'm facing at work. And it's really good. Yeah, fantastic. That's, yeah, mm. that's exactly what you need. Absolutely. Um, Awesome. Um, so in 2019, uh, Red Group closed its first capital raise, becoming the most successful fully subscribed energy crowd crowd sourced funding campaign in Australia's history. Um, would you be able to walk us through this process? What do you think it was that yourself and the team did that made this capital raise so successful? Um, merchandise, stickers. Um... <laughs> was actually one of the things that made it really successful so we did a whole bunch of merchandising for it we did a whole bunch of you know bringing bringing a kind of fun element to to what our capital raise was because we were going out to the public like we were going yeah. to um individuals right yeah so one of the one of the things was you know we're trying to raise money after startup boot um, just checking. Can you hear me? Okay, it's a little bit jittery. Okay. Yeah, no, that's not. It's not too bad, actually. Yeah, no, it's good. Okay, cool. Um, so what we did is we uh, so we went to VCs first, and we said, "Hey, we'd like to get some investment." And they said, "You're way too early. You've got no traction, really." We had a couple of couple of projects. We we have signed you know signed a project in Australia. We had a few others that were kind of on the boil. It was like, we need to see more traction. Otherwise, we're just going to take like 50% of your equity straight away. Um, and we had other VCs who were saying, yeah, cool, we'll take 5% and we'll give you a small amount of capital. Um, but it really wasn't enough capital to really do anything meaningful with. So mm -hmm. we sat back and we said, okay, what, why are we doing what we're doing? And what is, our, what is our end goal as a company? And I don't mean a goal as in to make money or to, be, to raise capital. As well as our own goal is our vision and mission. Our vision and mission is to have a transactive economy that everyone can participate in that is for people who have got solar on a roof, who don't have solar on a roof, large companies, small companies. We want the, everyone to participate in this. So how do we do this? And we, we thought, well, why don't we try this crowdfunding thing? Because we're going out to the world. And we were told by numerous people People who know what they're talking about, do not go and do this. It's a bad idea. You guys are not selling water bottles. Like you water bottles, breweries, they were all the companies kind of doing it at that point in time because they were B2C plays, whereas we were kind of more like B2B2C. And we just said, we just had this gut feeling like, well, we need to raise some capital. We think this is the way to do it. Um, let's do it. And we had like three or four people in the team at the time. And yeah. so we just, um, we signed up to go with virtual and do this thing. And we started making campaigns. Uh, I went to see a premiere of 2040 and it had Soul Share in it. And I was like, oh my God, that is what we're trying to do in Australia. Um, so I spoke to the impact producer. They were fantastic. Then we worked with Damon. We cut a little video because this is what we were trying to bring to the community. So really we led with, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy. We led with our hearts. We said, okay, what is it we want to do? How can we do this? And because we had kind of led that way, things just opened up and doors opened up and we we did the campaign. We, we then kind of ran a pretty pretty hard campaign like a lot of just videos lots of speaking events speaking at the premieres of 2040 um doing lots of stuff like that to kind of get our name out there we had a brand which was i mean we're called red grid we're not called green grid we're not called like climate grid we're called red grid because this is a fight this is a revolution this is a, something we got to push like it's not yeah. you know to deal with the climate issue so we kind of we use that kind of alert to sort of say cool let's get this happening and that's who we are as our personalities as well. So it kind of fed, fed really well. Yeah. Um, and then we didn't ask for too much money. So look, we raised $825,000. That is not a large amount of money. It was a small seed round, but it showed to our investors that we were not trying to raise a bunch of money and then just kind of squander it. We we're raising the right amount of money to deliver the outcomes. And we've done everything we said we do based on that money, including going through COVID. So then COVID hit, we took executive cut salary cuts, which were all pretty meager anyway, to try and survive and just ride it out. But we did everything we said we were gonna do. And that for me is validation. It was also validation 
Why do a crowd equity? Because it validates the social validation of your product. And even though these people may not be our customers in the future because we're still B2B to C, they want that in solution. And it showed that people wanted to be involved. And we have people who invested $50, like five zero. And we have people who invested $150,000. And so we had that spectrum of people who gave insights uh, and could give us validation. And they actually became the first people we tested our products with. Um, very rough, terrible products that basically <laughs> would you know, the worst MVPs ever, but we got information back and we yeah. started working with them and they started helping us. And so for us, and it was, you know, they're a community and they support us, you know, and that's what it's all about for us is like, okay, we're building this momentum behind us. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. Um, brilliant. Um, could you walk us through how you went about client acquisition and development? Which strategies did you use? I think you've touched on this a little bit already. Mm. Yeah, if there's any particular strategies you can think of. Um, first of all, uh, talking to a lot of people and being really open about where we were in the yeah. journey. You know, like, hey, we are building this product. It's not quite there yet, but we, we think it's got a validation or could be working really well in the problem space you're in. Tell us about the problems you're facing and trying to be open and go in with those questions about asking questions around problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's easy to go in and pitch your solution and we've fallen prey to that. And we still do all the time without kind of understanding their problems. It's also kind of like people say that, but you also, it's really hard to get a conversation with someone and say, Hey, can I phone you up and just ask you about all your problems? Cause a lot of people are busy. They're like, okay, what's in it for me? If I'm just going to tell you my problems. Yeah. So you kind of have to pitch a little bit, but yeah. it's kind of like opening up that way. Um, talking to a lot of people and being I mean, like, this is a strategy we just have is just to be really nice and to talk to as many people as possible. And then you find people, you know, like one of our clients is Mervac, the big property developers. They came because one of our friends from the original boot camp that we did at Melbourne uni at the power shop thing said, Hey, you guys should talk to this guy. I know Mervac. He's really great. And he really love what you guys do. And, oh, cool. Let's talk to him. Boom. They became a client and an investor. So, um, not quite like that. It doesn't happen over one conversation. And that's the other thing we learned is like, have, be aware that your first conversation is the closing conversation, but you've got to progress to the next step. Yeah. And so these are big organizations. They take a lot of working with and, and, and proving out yourself and proving who you are as individuals and your, your characteristics and your integrity um, that you follow through and that you, you, you want to actually see an end goal, but also being quite honest at the beginning and saying, Hey, the end goal for us here is to do a project with you and do a paid project with you and or get investment. That's what we want to see, but we realize there's a process to go through and just work with on that process because you can't close these things really quickly because they're big corporations. So it's really about thinking, hey, how do I, um, how do I help them get to the next step in their internal organization? Uh, and sometimes you go through like five of those steps of seven and it doesn't have falls apart and it doesn't work. And sometimes you get through all the way through to a contract and something's signed, that's fantastic. But knowing you've got to go through that and having enough, trying to have enough money so you can stay alive during that process is yeah. really needed. So a B2C player is different, you know, get a value proposition, get it up there, get someone who can submit their credit card details. Then you've got about, you've got a customer B2B is really different. You've got to, you've got to work through the process. There's many people to influence um, and to sell that product. But when you sell a product, you get a larger slice of money. So mm. it's a different way of doing things, but um, for client acquisition for us, and look, we just, we're not, We've been still focusing on a lot of, on product and problem. So we don't have a great deal of clients, um, but we've got increasing interest from clients. We know we're focusing now. We've been focused, we've been trying to narrow down on really finding product market fit. And we think we're getting close to it. Uh, we've just hired a brand new um, uh, CMO who's focused on that as well. So we're really interested in, you know, really narrowing down and doing that over the next 12 months, but it is, it's a real journey. Um, and you need salespeople who, or, or business development people who, really understand what you're doing because at the beginning it's all the founders are selling so i'm in a conversation all the time and now i've got some amazing i've got an amazing individual who works with us who just gets it and knows what he's doing also from melbourne uni um and just is out there talking to people and just they love what he's saying they love how he's doing it and and we've got these really interesting clients coming to us now like big big high street retailers phoning us up and saying uh you guys do this thing right and we're like yeah huh can we please have a conversation? Because we think it could really help us. And like, that's, that's where you want to get to. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's early days, right? We're still, you know, early days. It's been three years and it's early days. Oh my goodness. So exciting. Yeah. Um, 
Wow. Um, yeah, sorry, just to the just to everyone in the audience again, if you do have any questions again, as Sarah said, just please pop them in the chat. We will get to them eventually. Um, uh, what have I got here? Oh, yeah, so we'll just um, I'll just move on to clean energy innovation as well now, if that's OK. So um, as yeah. a recipient of a National Fellowship Award for Clean Energy Entrepreneurship Research, would you be able to expand on the importance of research on entrepreneurship and clean energy innovation? Um, do you have any advice on how founders can be clean energy entrepreneurs? Um, OK. I can. I just got it. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, uh, yes, it's really clean energy entrepreneurship is really tough because it's a sort of it's like a it's a small area of the economy. Right. It's a it's a, I mean, it's a small but Im super important area of the economy. If you look at the whole thing. Right. So. But at the same time, people see the value in it so it's kind of hard and easy in some way so it's hard in one way because it's a small area and you're dealing with big incumbents so we often tell the story of alexander graham bell versus thomas edison right alexander graham bell invented telephone system 1881 82 and now we have these like that will do a supercomputer in your hand way more powerful than any computers that sent man to, man to the moon um and he would never recognize that device in your hand. But if you took Thomas Edison, who invented the utility pretty much the same two years that Bell invented the telephone system, stuck like Thomas Edison in today's world, he would exactly understand the grid system we have, right? It's the same thing. So it's 150 odd years old. And so you're dealing with an industry that is not changed, that has been, it's changing, of course, there's a lot more solar, there's a lot more wind, there's all that kind of stuff changing, but the fundamentals of where the grid works is still very much the same thing. And so you're dealing with companies and engineers and people who've been trained in a very specific way to think about this and yet you're coming to them saying there's a completely different thing happening and that's you know the transition from a landline to a mobile one of my friend's dads told us when we were kids he says isn't it weird that you phone a house you phone a building to talk to a person in the old days right before yeah. mobiles you phoned a building yeah that's weird that is Which, weird yeah. yeah right so yeah. So now we're in this kind of thing with energy is that like, well, we've got this completely new energy system that's coming. So it gives us, we've got to, you've got to go against that, that hard inertia that's there. It's really difficult. The other part is that, um, you know, it's not a quick win. Lots of times you've got to work with hardware. You've got to work with um, more complex technologies to make it work. Whereas if you've coming up with a, like, you know, Slack, for example, came out of a gaming system, gaming startup that then had a good chat bot and they started using it was a good chat system. And so they started that, it became Slack, right? But then there's very little barriers to entry of that because it's just software. So if you're doing energy software, there's still some barriers. Like for us, we're a software company, we don't do hardware, but it's still barriers to us because we've got to integrate with hardware at some point. So yeah. you're kind of in this weird middle world. Um, I think the other part though on the plus side is that people realize how bad things are right now with, um, with the climate with energy systems with biodiversity with water there's a whole with waste there's a whole kind of you know renaissance of an, an understanding of how how much we do need to work on these problems and so there's a lot more money going into it so impact investing you know really wasn't a big thing 10 years ago and it is now and that's growing so i think there's a really good opportunity and i see a lot like when we're doing the boot camps and things at melbourne uni on this there's a lot of people who turn up and they want to solve the waste issue you know, waste is a big thing because it's in people's homes and you can kind of get it. Um, and that's really good. But there's also only so much you can do with like a new app, for example. So sometimes I think one of the biggest challenges that entrepreneurs face now is how do we really create something that is useful and can be scalable that isn't necessarily just a software play? How do you create those other plays that make sense? What about deep tech? What about other material science? What about other things that really can make a transformative change? What about software that has integrations into the real economy or real systems out there that can make a big difference so i think we've got to we've got to kind of entrepreneurship has been polarized for a really long time and here's deep tech it takes a long time there's multiple values of death versus here is you know software SaaS, kind of um, very low barrier to entry maybe one small valley of death at the beginning um, and i think we've got to understand that those two are kind of coming together mm. for us there's definitely two valleys of death that we have to navigate you know, there's your ideation and problem formation, and then there's your, then there's your uh, market capture and scaling of revenue. Um, and that for us is, you know, I think for entrepreneurs looking at specifically environmental or social or those kind of issues, they got, you've got to figure out, okay, how do I make the values of death less long 
and how do I bring in kind of some of that fast iteration stuff we see in other entrepreneurs? Yeah. Absolutely. Does that answer the question well enough? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. Um, just in your personal opinion, how do you think uh, Australia is tracking right now just in terms of developing greener technologies? Do you think we're behind the rest of the world? Have you seen some good, you know, fantastic innovation coming out of this space? What do you think? Um, so there's an interesting report that came out from WF a couple of years ago that was about innovation in Australia on clean tech. And um, we're, I say Australia is really good at deep research and innovation, research innovation. And um, I mean, coming up with fantastic new kind of scientific ways of dealing with stuff. I mean, classic example is Wi-Fi, of course, that everyone talks about, um, but bad at commercializing. And that's okay. where it falls down. So we see a lot of tech entrepreneurs obviously, you know, leaving, not just in clean tech, but a lot of tech entrepreneurs in general leaving and taking, because money and capital is easier overseas. Um, and so uh, that is the challenge. So there's a lot of innovation and, you know, we have some of the best thinkers and some of the best, um, well, we have the best incentive in the world, to be honest, to do this because yeah. of all the nations of the world, we are uh, all the nations of the world with lots of money because it's a very rich country and we're on the forefront of climate impacts so there's a big incentive for us to take innovation very seriously for climate technology for example um but we're not doing well on the financing mm -hmm. like it's still vc approaches in australia are still pretty you know they're pretty standard they're not there's a there seems to be a there's money there's definitely money there but there's a there's a different approach to what it is say in the u.s so if you're in the US, got a great idea, passionate founders, founders who seem like they know what they're doing, maybe haven't quite figured it out yet, you can get, you can sign some pretty nice seven figure deals, seed round. Here that is very tough. Yeah. So I think that's the, that's the challenge here. It's like, we've got great innovation, great scientists, great applied research, but commercializing that is still really tough. And there's, it's, you know, there's efforts to do it, you know, commercialization grants, tax incentives, arena cfc there's all that there in the clean tech space but it's still um it's just not the same environment that you see overseas i hope that's changing i think it's changing you know the more i talk to more investors the more i'm seeing individuals as individual people in these firms who get it and who are like all right we're going to do this we're going to take a punt off we go um yeah so but it needs to it needs to rapidly accelerate if we yeah. deal with the climate issue yeah it's sort of what i thought you would say to be honest with you but yeah it's really good to get your thoughts it's a tough um, one I've, yeah. I've heard um like i've spoken to some investors i've spoken to a lot of investors some investors you know who are directly in our space and and it's totally okay for people to choose not to invest in your company absolutely but the reasons i got were just didn't make any sense whatsoever you know they were like why haven't you not dominated the market already and this we're looking for a seed round and they were like, okay, we need, we need tons of revenue traction. We need dominant, you know, dominance in that market. We need absolute product market fit. I'm like, we're, we're asking for like half a million dollars. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's it's, crazy. Yeah. So it's a very, very different landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. I am just going to pass over to Sarah now, um, just for the Q and a session. Um, but I'll be back at the end just to wrap up with you guys. So over to you, Sarah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Abby. Um, so like we were talking about before, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat and I'll get to them in order. But uh, Adam, I could ask you questions literally all day. Um, I made so many notes. <laughs> the most notes I've made for a fireside chat all year. Um, you were talking earlier about the founder relationships within your team and the friendships that um, you'd formed. How important do you think that was to the success of Red Grid? Mm -hmm. Oh, like the most important thing. Absolutely. And like, we're still like my two co-founders are in that room over there. Like, you know, <laughs> and co -founders. Co -founders, we didn't, we didn't know each other before we started doing this. Like we were not like, we weren't old friends or anything like that. We met each other through this and I have probably luck and uh, a, lot, a lot of luck that we met each other and, and that we had similar kind of incentives, but it's sort of like, ways of thinking about things but as be the founder relationship is absolutely huge and we've had our problems like we've had our problems as you know as individuals trying to like deal with each other at different points in time and um you have to acknowledge that and part of the really good thing at start bootcamp actually was very much you know they focused on specific sessions for us to deal with um tension and, and challenges within the team because they emerge because you're dealing with really stressful situations 
you know, it's kind of like we've got, you know, there's no money. Or well, we, we work for a year and a half with this without $1 arriving in our bank accounts. And so how do you do that? How do you balance your life? All that kind of stuff. Um, but if you, and, and a lot of questions to each other and trying to figure out who they are quite quickly and trying to figure out who you are. And I realized that, you know, I realized these are good human beings. And, you know, you've kind of form a, you form a very special relationship because you're in this firestorm the whole time. And you, it's a lot, if you're in a, you form each other, you, you get together, you form this organization and you say, okay, how much do we have each other's backs? And if you've got each other's backs, hundred percent, even if you have to have arguments, but there's care for the other individual, there's care for each other as you're building it, you can kind of work through those things. And that, you know, we've, we've been through ups and downs in, in our relationships, but also in obviously in the business. And I love these guys, like they're like brothers to me. So it's, I think that's where, you, you kind of, for me, it's where we have to get to, to keep it sustaining. And, uh, and for that is a, if you're forming, a, and we've tried to build companies where we try and find partners that you don't really know, or, or, and who are kind of in it for a different reason. They're arguing about their equity straight away and they're kind of pushing, just like, yeah, it's not going to work. So we work for a year and a half. With, I mean, I don't, I don't advocate this. We work for a year and a half without shareholders agreement. So um, that's not a great idea because you kind of, you know, it's a good idea to get that sort of out relatively early. Um, and we just had a, we had a gentleman's agreement, which is just don't do that. Get, get an agreement in place on paper. Um, but we had a gentleman's agreement. And to be honest, because then when we did our our raising, we said, well, that's what we said. So this is what it is. You know, we, that gave me assurance that these people are genuine. And that was fantastic, you know. Mm, it sounds like the uh, only work with smart and nice people applies yeah, yeah <laughs> within your company man. as well as external Absolutely. Um, we do have a couple of questions um which is awesome the first one's coming from bonnie um which is how do you juggle your time wearing your lecturer hat versus mm. your startup founder hat and that's a very pertinent question we do have a few program managers and coordinators um who are watching today mm. yeah yeah hey bonnie it's good to see you um uh, it's really, uh, it's really hard sometimes. Uh, one of the things is, are they synergistic? Like, do they, do they work together? Um, do I learn, do I learn things from either of them to help in the other? I think is there any way to, to look at it? Um, and uh, so that, and they do, that's the thing. So I think it makes the juggle a little easier. I always get a bit stressed before I've got to go and do a bunch of teaching. Cause I'm like, have we updated the slides? Is it working? The other stuff doesn't really stop. And they keep, you know, you'll keep getting pinged on things. I think the other part is that, and I'm just not very good at this. So I'm really trying harder at it is to be, to, to be able to switch off from one to go to the other. Um, uh, and so you have some dedicated time for it. And so, you know, I've done teaching before where like, you know, the class is having a break. Now, I do intensives as well. So it's like a week or, you know, long weekends or something where everyone else is having lunch and I'm just like frantically pumping out emails and messages to get stuff done. And it's too stressful. So um, a couple of things to juggle is, and for a long time, we didn't have enough staff. So now we've got really great staff who are working with us and, and they can handle most of this stuff. So that's really good. Um, and the other part is trying to be as, um, hmm, organized and disciplined with your time as possible against those different um, obligations you've got and speech telling each of those obligations where you have obligations to the other. So I said to my the guys at Red Grid, hey, I'm out for the next two weeks because i got to do this teaching, so give me some space. And they're really respectful of that. And for the university, I'm like, hey, I'm <laughs> running a company. Please give me some, you know, please understand that I don't get you know, as much done probably as, as some other people. And, and, and then you have to work out is the trade-off, is the benefit that I bring to the teaching or something I do at the university better than someone who is just doing the university work? And is the benefit I bring to the company better than someone who just does the company? As soon as that doesn't happen, it's probably not worth doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also pretty subjective. Yeah, it's hard. It's really, really hard. Yeah. So that's not a very good answer, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, good answer. Um, we do have a question from Mackenzie as well, who asks, um, with so much happening in the environmental space, how do you navigate and avoid being just another environmental or sustainability startup? And what advice would you give to founders entering that space on how they can navigate it? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's such a, you know, we have a lot of competition. There's a lot of people working in this space. Um, I would say, you know, we always used to lead with join the climate fight and come and help us do this stuff and be our, be our clients. And, 
you know, to be honest, most people, that's like third or fourth down the line of what they want in terms of signing a deal because people have KPIs, they need to hit key performance indicators, they need to, you know, be working with companies who can deliver products. And so we've really, we've learned this the hard way, tried to go back to, okay, what is the fundamental value we provide to that? that customer, that outcome. And um, for example, in the property space, you know, we were talking to them, hey, you can save this much on your, you save this much energy, you can save this much carbon, blah, blah, blah. And, and our property guys were like, we're a property company. Like, yeah, we care about that. Like we've got a net zero by 2030 goal. This is Novak, right? So they're, on, they're aligned with us in that. But when you're talking to the person who's gonna make the decision on this, that's not their number one goal. Their number one goal is sell more fantastic houses. Uh, get more people to rent more often and have less vacancy rates. They want to save money on how much energy they spend. They're the things you've got to speak to when you're, when you're trying to sell them your product. And so I think differentiating yourself in the market is to say, is to say our fundamental core belief is environmental sustainability and X, Y, and Z. But what we really do is we give you this and this saves you money. This gets you more customers. This does helps your business do what your business does at its core even better. I think that's the bit we've got to get to. And it's kind of similar to the Slack example, right? It started as a, a gaming company, ended up being Slack because it did Slack so well, it did the kind of messaging so well. And so that solved the key problem for that, that, that cohort. So I think for, for everyone who's trying to be an environmental entrepreneur, it's not enough to be the environmental entrepreneur anymore. It's not new enough. It's not innovative enough. It has to solve the problem, but it also has to give that end user or, or that customer something that's inherently valuable to them. And that's quite yeah, tricky, fantastic. but it's definitely doable. It's mm, great advice. Um, and I think we've also all noticed that you've got a little I-O-E-N sitting on the end of your... Ah. Um, <laughs> Do you that's, want to tell us a little bit more about, I think it's the Internet of Energy Network? That's right. It's the Internet of Energy Network. I'm just going to change offices. Um, <laughs> so here we are. Um, now I'm at Iron. Uh, so Iron is the Internet of Energy Network. So back in, uh, when we did our crowd raise, we, if we, a publicly available document, our, our crowdsourced funding document said, hey, we're, gonna, we're going to launch a open source crypto protocol that's going to build, that we're going to enable people around the world to have for free, to build on, to create the transactive layer that enables these things to talk to each other. Um, and so in October this year, we launched that. So it's a six month campaign to raise crypto finance and to get that going. Uh, we launched it. So we have a token that's wild now. Um, so you can, you can get it on Uniswap, um, on Quickswap, on gate.io. There's a bunch of places where you can get it. Um, and but what's really important about that is if you go to the iron.tech website, you can see why it's so important to have a crypto play here. Now we have a fundamental viewpoint of where the future is heading. And that is that um, currencies are changing, you know, fiat and, and normal currencies in the bank accounts are devaluing day by day. We have stagflation that's coming. There is a whole new world of decentralized finance that is going to be used in the future. And energy is going to be decentralized as well. And so we, apps firmly believe that we actually don't have to, in the future, we won't have to worry about energy too much because super cheap generation of energy through solar panels and wind farms, still some network provision. You have to have poles and wires bringing the energy to different people and that costs money, but there's going to be a whole economy of, 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 of credits that can stay within the energy system and don't have to go out to your bank account. It can just be covered because there's ways for people to help balance the grid. And so what we did is we basically, came up with the protocol that enables that balancing to happen. And we launched that as a project in the crypto space because crypto, well, first there's a lot of money in crypto. There's a lot of people who want to do different things, a lot of application for this. And the cool thing about this was we were going to do this back in 2018. I remember at the beginning of this conversation, I said we can't, couldn't find the technology to make it work in the blockchain space. Since then, we've met the guys at Holochain because Holochain, even despite its name, is actually not a blockchain, but it's actually a very much like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, BitTorrent system that doesn't have all the mining problems and all the scalability problems, all the difficult stuff we saw in blockchain. And so we've actually developed and deployed our technology already in the Monash University microgrid uh, using some holochain technology. And we're building this now for Iron to give this to the world. And then we always say we'd open source it and that's what we're doing. So that's really, really great for us because, and for the world, because 
hey, here's this um, transactive protocol that anyone, if you're in Burkina Faso, if you're in Mongolia, if you're in London, anywhere, can use it and build energy applications on top of it and then be part of this global internet of energy thing, which is like we talked about at the beginning with this soul share connection between different places on earth to help people transact value. But for us, it was a bigger kind of play than that. Now, Redgrid is a for-profit company, equity invested, that will be looking for an acquisition and an exit and a material liquidity event at some point. A material liquidity event is when people, all the shareholders get their money back, could be an IPO, could be an acquisition, whatever it might be. But Redgrid is building on top of that open source protocol. And so what we're doing there is we're actually saying to the world, hey, here's this thing that is open source. If you've got developers and you want to build on it, please, we would love you to do it. You know, build on the Internet of Energy Network. If you want us to go and do it for you and build those kind of applications and integrations you want, fantastic. Regular will do that for you but for a cost. So we've actually got now, and this is why we see the world. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to have to build it themselves. They want to be a nice off the shelf package. Fantastic. Come and pay for that. If you want to build it yourself, we fully support you. And we're opening the Iron Academy to help train people to do this. We're opening up um, a bunch of uh, use case workshops very shortly so we can bring people in and work through this. The cool thing about being crypto is we now have a, a pipeline of really interesting partnerships, both in uh, in crypto, in DeFi, doing very interesting things there, where the world is, is inexorably going to head, uh, and in the and in the kind of vir- in the real physical world, you know, actually large energy providers, large energy technology providers who are signing partnerships, and partnerships are coming up, and I can't tell you about them right now because they're in the works, um, but they're very exciting when they come out. But the key bit there is we suddenly got this thing that is has got a life in this whole other ecosystem that's worth two trillion dollars. So, for us, that you know, rather than being it's a it's a crypto play that is um, not fit for purpose. For us, the way we see this now is very much technology is fit for purpose to solve the problem, and now it's a question of galvanizing the community to come do it together. And that's why Iron was born as a. Uh, that's why Iron was born as a as an entity, as a separate organization to Red Grid. Um, and yeah, and we're actually hiring people. So we're really, really, we're completely like, we have a lot of work on and a lot of things to do. So we're actually hiring people. So if there's anyone who's kind of watching and participating here, we are looking for some people to help us out with business development on Iron. We're looking up some people to do project delivery on Iron and Red Grid. So um, yeah, look on our website. You can see those different um, things that are open. But yeah, that's Iron in a, in a nutshell. And it's also, one last thing is it's called a network because the cool thing about crypto is you can the whole bit is you can you can decentralize the decision making. Right now, the humans are making decisions in this. So we're making decisions, but ultimately, what we have is a set of rules to make decisions by themselves, both at, both at a macro layer and at a micro layer in these mini grids. So essentially, what you get to in the end is a transactive layer in a community. And a community could be four houses, it could be forty houses, it could be four hundred thousand houses. All of those machines talking to each other, balancing energy, using energy when it's one hundred percent green giving rewards back to people who use their energy effectively and efficiently because the protocol allows them to do it. And then they become, it's called a decentralized autonomous organization. They become their own machine led um, entity. And that means we don't have to worry about industry, you know, captured by politicians or captured by certain industry, you know, um, people who've got more money than others. Actually what it becomes is a, a thing that says, we prioritize on these rules, clean energy at all times, equity that people have access to and supporting those people who are willing to support this um, support this kind of key uh, emergence of new energy technology. So that's a long winded answer. We're very excited about this. It's, oh, it yeah. sounds incredible. It's given me a genuine reason to go and learn about crypto now. <laughs> yeah, it, look, it is. And it's, it's really, it's a fascinating place to be right now because, because it's, you know, who would have thought that you could go to Woolies and tap your phone to pay for your groceries even five years of course and so that's all the cryptos can be in the future amazing um with that um i am going to kick back over to abby to ask you what's next um and close off for the event amazing thanks sarah thank you so much um yeah so i've just got to ask you one last question adam um just because i'm so intrigued i'm not gonna lie um but what are your what are you working on now what's next for you what are your main focuses going to be over the next 12 months bit of a uh, loaded question but yeah. or <laughs> uh just for you just for you personally ah, yeah whether that could yeah, be yeah. Red Grid or iron or yeah yeah great so for um 
Look, I'll talk with you, right? So for RegGrid, we've just got some funding from the government to deliver a neighborhood battery initiative, a feasibility study that's really good. We've got a, um, some clients who are coming down the pipeline to help deploy our technology and some really great property developments. So um, we will be, over the next 12 months, really focusing in on, on that you know, product market fit and traction. Uh, and you know, people will see a lot more about RegGrid in the news and the media. Um, and uh, you know, we're looking for, to help people move into houses where it can be as you know, effective, energy effective as possible. Um, for, for what it means for a company for us is growth. So we're hiring people, um, we've got more, yeah, more projects coming down the pipeline and that means more capital raising. So as you, as a founder, you're always capital raising basically. So that's the yeah. uh, next thing. So that would be our series A. Um, and then for iron, it is building our community. So, you know, it's great. We've got 35,000 people on telegram. We've got 45, 50,000 people on Twitter. That's great. But we're building a community to support what iron is doing because, they know there's a bunch of partnerships coming down the line that are really exciting, that they're actually deploying the iron technology uh, to these real world um, partnerships and that there's a, a demand for it. And so that's really exciting. We're super excited about what we can do with this um, NFT campaigns and mini grids in developing countries because it shows exactly how we can use it in the future. Um, so over the next 12 months, we'll be building out that, building out the community, um, hearing about use cases in the community and then implementing technology in those places. And then we'll have technology releases happening over the next three months um for both red grid and iron so it's kind of in this phase where we're kind of really like ramping up and getting out um yeah. really fast and really hard so that's really good um for me personally uh it's about building the team and mm -hmm. building a group of people you know we've got more people coming in it's it's finding um new kind of ways of engaging people and new ways of engaging our team making sure that everyone's happy and, and involved and wants to you know be there for the whole journey um, and for me personally, it's trying to juggle. So it goes back to Bonnie's question. How do we juggle different all roles? Um, yeah. Yeah, different hats and making sure that both those roles, are, or all three of those roles right now um, are, are really working well. Yeah. So, and I think for us, you know, as a company, you're never, you're kind of, as a young entre young entrepreneurial venture or ventures, you're, ne you're not really out of the woods. So you're mm. always looking for, okay, how do we, capitalize on the market? How do we shift where we are in the market? How do we make sure we've consolidated our position? Um, that's still going on. So the next 12 months are obviously critical for that as well. Um, but we are looking forward to what it brings because, you know, like here's the big thing, it's 2022 in what, 31 days time? And then when we Very, use, that means we're yeah. eight years away from where we need to be at 2030 yeah. for our net zero emissions. And I've been in this climate game for a long time. And every year it's like okay and we now have i think it's now we have 96 months to reach net zero that we to avoid catastrophic climate change when you think about it that way we're we've got to accelerate there is no way out of this and like there's no plan b there's no mm -hmm. planet b there's mm -hmm. nothing else we have there is 100 we have to achieve this and so people say this isn't like i a friend of mine texted me this morning because he's in british columbia and canada a ton of flooding it's like i've got massive climate anxiety i was like don't worry man we got this but we got to do this fast mm -hmm. and i think that's the kind of call to action that goes back to mackenzie's question is offer people value that they see right now today but then give them a vision for the future and say if we do this right everyone has clean fair cheap electricity forever like is that not a goal worth trying to get and i think for us then it's like okay cool this next 12 months is saying that's what we got to get to because in 12 months time we're now we're then at what 86 or 84 months left and after that we're at 72 months and it's like that counting clock down has got to be in people's minds as well as providing value today and that's kind of an exciting place to be right it's a big vision and I remember, I mean, like, whether you hate him or, or love him, Mal Gore spoke about this at, a, at an event in Oxford when I was back when I was there. And uh, he said, I really like this. He said, what a noble cause to have to work on for your, for your whole life. Like, what a noble thing to do and try and save your planet. Not a bad thing to do and get up every day and do it. So that's what we're going for the next 12 months. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Okay. Um, I know we've just gone past one thirty, so I will wrap up now, but yeah, thank you so much for today. Um, uh, thanks everyone as well on the call. Thank you for joining us. Um, massive thank you to Adam. Um, we've absolutely loved hearing, uh, having you here and hearing about your incredible journey. Thank you so much. Um, so if people would like to get in contact with you, what would be the best way to reach out to you, Adam? 
Well, I'll do, I'll tell you what I think I'd love you all to do is join our Telegram chat for Iron. So go to go to our Telegram on Iron. You can get it through the iron.tech website. Follow us on Twitter. That's the best way to get all the information. I've got updates on that for Regrid and Iron. Um, in terms of reaching out to me, uh, like LinkedIn is good. You can email me at adam at regrid.io. Um, and so, yeah, just send me, a, send me a message. And yeah, that's the best way to reach out. Um, we've got yeah, we've got great people in the team. We are looking to hire some, we're looking to hire a fantastic project delivery manager. We're looking at some great BD people. So if you're interested in that stuff, get in touch. But uh, yeah, look forward to hearing from you. But thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, to everyone just on the call, just before you go, if you'd like to keep up to date regarding our future events, uh, make sure you sign up to our MAP and TRAM newsletters. Um, so our team will be sending out a recording of the chat today. Um, and I'll include a link to our newsletters and how to connect with us on socials in that email as well. So again, thank you guys so much for today. This is brilliant. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, Adam. Everyone. Thanks, Abby. Bye, everyone.